I am very pleased to bring you this latest episode of In The Wheels podcast. Today we have the quite amazing uh, Michelein van Kloof. Um, she's a really nice person, to be honest. Um, super friendly and easy to chat to. Um, she's very witty. Um, I think that comes across so you get a good sense of uh, her sense of humour. Um, and hopefully we can see her on home roads um well home roads for us not for her um at the women's tour of britain she'll be racing that you do hear a bit about that and and her role within the team um going into that race um as well as her developing role through various teams and uh places that she's ridden for um it's a great chat i just hope you enjoy hi thank you so much for joining me tonight how are you doing yeah, I'm really good, actually. Yeah, thank you for asking. Ah, good. Um, I guess it's kind of an obvious question, but it's one I like asking, and especially to, to Dutchies as, as well, because it's like, how did you get into cycling when <laughs> I, I would assume, like, for someone like yourself, it's like, it's as natural as breathing almost. Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, I think I rode my first bike when I was, like, probably two and a half so you know we we ride our bikes to school and and um yeah the, for, for us it's quite normal like i used to ride probably 10k a day from age four or five because yeah you have to go to school and then you have to go back and you have to go back again and so that's quite normal but i didn't start like properly racing until i was well i got my first racing bike when i was eight uh for my birthday but then i crashed it within a few weeks and then my mom wouldn't let me race again so I got I got my brother's bike when I was 10 and then I was allowed to race again. Um, but yeah, I wasn't any good at that age, but I just really enjoyed it because my brothers did it and my parents did it as well. So um, it was very fun. Um, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess then at what stage did it start becoming, you know, a, something that could be a career? Did you ever... You know, because obviously eight-year-old cr- you crashing no. it probably isn't going, oh, yeah, I could be racing the, the Tour de France farm. Not that yeah. it exists at this stage. But, no, you know. no. And it was very difficult as well because at that stage, I didn't realise you could actually make a career out of this. Um, and I didn't realise this quite late as well because um, for me, I've I've not mentally turned professional until like two years ago, maybe. Um and that was mainly because, well, for me, it was never a job because I could never earn enough money to live off it, um, which that's why I did studies and, and, and got my career into physical therapy and, and worked as a physical therapist for five years next to cycling. Because for me, cycling was always something I enjoyed to do and I, 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 I could do well and I enjoyed, but I was never fortunate enough to earn enough money or like also how women's cycling develops. It was never, you were never able like, five seven years ago to actually earn enough money unless you were you know the world's best and um so actually i didn't realize you could actually make a career out of this until i was maybe maybe even three four years ago and i was like oh wow this is actually could be possible to be a professional cyclist and actually live of this wow that's kind of crazy because like you've got a, a deep history in the sport like racing for like what the, the rc like jan van Achel, and yeah. then moving on to uh, Lotto Ladies and then um, I've just looked this up. Like I've I've been on on quite a few teams and I've I've been around there for a while. And and when I was back on my club team, I I wrote for my club team for three years and when I turned 18. So um, like I I had my three years of of, um, discovering what type of rider I was and basically what the under 23 level is now and where it's going to. I got to do in, in my club team, but then as well, we were able to do big UCI races like Nisblad and, and, and Salmon and those kind of races as a club team. So I could already get a little taste of these kind of races and, and, and do uh, racing on a higher level to the elite women, um, which was a, was a big step from, from the club racing, but you could actually develop quite a lot in, in a club team back then. Yeah. And there's a couple of strands I want to pick up. Um, I think we'll talk about your, your physical therapy um, knowledge in a bit. Um, but I wanted to, to touch upon, like, 
finding out what type of rider you are because not everyone's familiar with your work and you know when i was looking up your results i was like you you just get a lot of top tens you're kind of very consistent um and that's that's the further question is like how how do you manage to be so consistent because you know a lot of cycling can go in wild ups and wild downs and you're just always like ticking over in the top 10 all the time um yeah. and then yeah like what type of rider are you um well it, it's quite funny i've always been labeled as a sprinter um because i have a fast finish um but the funny thing is i'm physically not a typical sprinter like i don't have that high five seconds like i'm not a lorena weavers who can just kick off and get everyone on 10 meters um i'm more type like a strong 30 seconds one minute type of sprinter can hold a lo long uh long lead out basically so i've been doing a lot of lead outs um throughout my like the past years and that's the thing i'm really strong in but also my positioning is quite good um so once you put yourself in the position of the fastest sprinter and you hold on to the wheel you're basically gonna roll quite a good result um so i think if you get yourself up there um yeah you can you can get that result but doesn't necessarily mean that I'm I've got a fast finish so to say um mm. but yeah I think I think it's basically how you look at it as well because the past few years I've been basically helping out a lot of sprinters um I used to be lead out for um Tata Martinez Mike van der Duin uh Daria Pikulik last year and um yeah before Chloe Hoskin and and I learned a lot from those sprinters as well uh, which I think is very interesting and I really like the dynamic to work together and Basically, you really need to trust the person in front of you um, and trust the person behind you that they will follow you um, to have that dynamic that you're going to be there in the first corner first and that your sprint is going to be in your wheel, which I think is very cool. But it also means that when you have, once you have a plan, you need to be able to execute it properly. Um, so you need to be consistent. You need to be there every time and they need to count on you, which I've been trying to basically make my trademark <laughs> that I they know when there's a finish and I'm there and I know which line I'm going to take that I'm probably quite a solid wheel to be on. But for me, sadly, I'm not as fast with my kick in the end to actually beat them on the line. Um, but yeah, I'll still yeah. be there, be there at the end to take the points. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, let, let's talk about physical therapy very quickly. Like, cause is it a good thing to have that knowledge or can it be potentially bad? Because you're like, if a, a team physio is working on you and you're like, oh, I wouldn't be doing it like that. <laughs> like, oh, that's the wrong technique. Like, uh, does that happen or is it more just... It does it sometimes. Helps? But the, the thing is as well, you learn a lot from each other as well. Um, I've, I've picked up a lot of funny tricks and things from different physios over the years, which I'm very grateful for because I still use them in my practice. Um, and it's it's quite interesting actually to see what everyone does and if someone's very inexperienced and, and asking questions and wanting to learn i will give them some tips but i will never <laughs> tell a physio how to do a job uh, if they know how to do it and you've got the different techniques as well so I'll, I'll try to to ask questions as well if i'm i don't really understand what they're doing why they're doing something and it makes for for a very interesting discussions but i think it also helps a lot that you recognize your own little uh pains and aches and and things and that you can know what to do about it for example if i start feeling my lower back and i think did i do my exercises and if i didn't i'm like ah okay that's that's why and you make sure that you don't get any long-term injuries that way as well so you recognize them before they get really bad basically yeah i also suppose it's probably helpful because you can speak a similar language almost like you can speak <laughs> on an expert level rather than being this kind of novice versus the expert yeah 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 and you can share share different opinions and discussions about what to do and i think it's quite interesting and and i learn a lot from it still and it's something i want to do later in my career probably as well so all the knowledge i can get i will i will try to obtain wow um so yeah you've talked about some of the different teams you've been on like I guess, like, what informs your decision when it comes to, to choosing which team to go on? Because, you know, is it a case of, you know, there's some riders I've spoken to who it's like, no disservice to them, but it's kind of, they've had the mentality of any port in a storm. Like, 
any team that will have me, I'll go for. Mm-hmm. And others, you know, you get tons of offers and you're like having to pick the best out of that. Um, you know, what what goes through your mind when, um, when you've got offers? Well, the thing is, for me, most of the time, it's very difficult, I think, from me as type of rider to place me in the right team because I think straight off the bat there's a few teams that are going to straight drop off already that I won't fit in and I think that has a lot to do with my type of racing the type of rider I am and the way that how I behave in the bunch so I'm quite a vocal rider um that means like I will normally take quite a role as a team captain um Mm -hmm. and if you have a very solid team that already has that base and 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 that uh layout then i don't think i will fit in very well um so i think if, if a team is looking for someone that wants to basically help set up the lead out um uh maybe uh, coach some of the younger girls through the peloton help them with um their fear in the bunch which i've come across quite a lot in my career uh, with teammates that are really scared in the bunch and i've been trying to coach them and, and help them get over that fear um, or just with technical skills like going through corners fast or uh, keeping your position, those kind of things. I think I'm very helpful uh, for that team and also just um, the, the the tactical stuff. So if a decision needs to be made in a in a race situation that someone needs to make that decision, then uh, in a team situation, that's normally me making that decision. Um, but again, then you need to have the trust from the riders. You need to fit well in the team. And for me personally, I, I I really want to be in a team where I feel at home and I can be myself. And that's one one of the main choices of why I would make a choice for a team. It's not because they have the best money or they have the best. Um, well, the, the the basically for me the one thing the environment needs to be there. So the professional environment. Mm. So we've got everything there. And then next to it, it needs to be a social, happy, fun environment. Um, because I've noticed through the years that if that's not there, I'm not very, um, uh, I'm performing less basically. Uh, and don't know what exactly that is, but just if I feel less happy, I'm going to perform less. So I would always mm. want to have an environment that supports that basically. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Actually. I can see how, because one of my questions is going to be like, how did the whole move to Hess like come about? Um, and that will still remain a question when I've finished talking. But um, like, I can see why that makes sense from from their perspective. Like, you can become a kind of focal point road captain that they need um, because it is quite a young team and quite a lot of kind of unknown riders, so to speak. Like, yeah, they're not big names, uh, and you can kind of be that that linchpin that brings it all together and there's a lot of different nationalities as well so having someone who's who's been there and seen it and done it can kind of yeah just as I said bring it all together um so yeah how, how did the move come about I'm always fascinated by the kind of it, it it might be boring to some and I apologize to them but to me it's like the whole mechanics of a transfer and contract and all that admin it's kind yeah. of fascinating because it's I don't it know is. anything about it. Yeah, it is it is very interesting. Um I've I've had a few transfers, um, not always my choice, uh, I must say. Mm-hmm. But um last year it was actually going very well. Um I really enjoyed being on human powered health and I think it was quite a good fit for me as well, being in the spring train and we got some really good results. Um but yeah, basically it came to the point that they were gonna sign me. And then realized that they already signed quite a lot of riders. And mm. yeah, they told me that they didn't have any budget left to sign me as well. Um, which was very difficult uh, because it was the end of the year. And also they told me that they would sign me, which was yeah quite hard for me to hear then uh, that it was not going to happen. Uh, but yeah, mm. that kind of stuff happens in a big organization. You know, there's miscalculations and, and all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah. But that meant that I was out of the contract and had to find another team. Um, we talked to a few teams. We spoke to a few teams. And basically, yeah, the main thing in my head was as well, like I told you, uh, the environment needs to be there. And that was my main yeah. main, main thing, uh, main concern. And I also had for myself a, a rule that if, um, because I made the decision to stop work last year, 
uh, to fully focus on cycling that if I was unable to earn enough money uh, through cycling uh, that I was going to stop uh, and fully focus on my uh, my my physio career basically because um, I've I've done this now a, a, a quite a few years where I was being underpaid quite quite a lot um, mm. and yeah you can't live of it um, and I was not going back to that so for me I made that decision like okay I need to be um, financially independent in this scenario and we came across Hess um, already had a really good talk with them um or quite early already and i i actually didn't really know about them they've been racing a little bit and um i've seen them about but i didn't know really what team it was and to be fair i, I spoke to a lot of my colleagues in the peloton and they had no idea who the team was um so they were a bit um cautious as well because with the whole zaf uh team last year yeah. a lot of the riders and also from the bnb hotels um things mm. the riders were a bit skeptical about the whole thing and and i did my research and i spoke to a lot of people about it and um me and my manager had a good talk about it and we were like well this is a very good opportunity to basically we saw it as an opportunity for me to step into a role that i'm i, I can step up basically but also have the opportunity to get results to show myself to see what i can do if i get the opportunities um that i maybe have not had over the last few years just to see where it would go. Um, mm. And I've been really enjoying that role as well. So I, I, it's very weird if you've been racing for other people quite a lot, and then all of a sudden you are at this big race and it's just like, well, you know, uh, try to get the results and you're just like, oh, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> that is, that is, that's quite a different mindset and I had to get used to that a little bit. Um, but I think now that um, I'm, I'm, I've gotten quite used to it and we've been trying to fine tune the team to basically teach the basics because a lot of these girls, like you, you say, like either very young or very inexperienced. So we've been trying to build up something on the positioning, on the timing, on how to do a lead out, how to uh, position your teammates, um, how to support the riders, basically um, all the all the fundamentals, um, which I think has been going really well. Um, if we see how how it's developing and how we've been racing, um, but yeah, it's it's taken some time, which is yeah normal, I guess. Yeah, and is that maybe tiring? Perhaps I don't know. Like because you're kind of you're the focal point, but it it seems like you're very much a mentor for the younger riders, and you know I think there's a lot of reward to be had from that. You know that that you're even if they you know if they stay with the team or not, like you're still making better riders out of them. And I think that's in like, you know, a bit about me was I wanted to be a teacher when I was younger because mm -hmm. it's all about the next generation and making people better than they currently are. Yeah. And I can see the value in that, mm -hmm. but I guess it could also be quite tiring <laughs> because there's a lot of pressure on you as the leader, as the focal point and the mentor, like, that's a lot going on. Yeah, it is. It is a lot. To be fair, I've, I'm. I'm. It's good that I stopped work because I've got a lot of extra <laughs> things on my plate at the moment. But um, no, I've actually really been enjoying it. Um, I, I see it as an opportunity as well to develop my coaching skills. Um, uh, I've I've done this quite a bit. Like I've worked with a lot of young riders and I've tried to help them and try to figure out different characters, which I think is most difficult for me to try and figure out how people respond to certain ways of speaking how to work together in in the race as well how to uh, communicate in a way that people find um nice to work with basically with because I, well you can ask anyone in the peloton i'm very loud and i can't help it it's like mm -hmm. basically it's it's a response so if something happens i will yell or you know when there's a middle section i will say there's a middle section you will hear it um those kind of things but also if i'm communicating to my teammates who are in front of me i'll be like quite loud so that they hear me and they know where where to go and what to do um and for most of my teammates i hear like okay that's very nice because i just hear you and know you're there and i know where to go and know what to do so it's great um so but sometimes like that's also difficult because some riders might find it like a bit harsh uh, because if someone scream at you mm. you're like oh okay wait what do you want uh what's going on um so like it's 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 trying to find the balance between um 
how to communicate with people, how to work with different people, uh, what you can say, what you cannot say. I figured that out the hard way <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yeah. uh, that you say something wrong and you get a very strong response and you look, oh, okay, I didn't expect that that was going to hit that way. Um, but yeah, I think it's very useful for the future as well to learn all this stuff. And it, especially you learn fast and stressful situations, which I think is, is a good thing. Um, so yeah, I actually quite get a lot of energy out of it. But yeah, sometimes in, when you're like trading and doing all this other stuff, you get quite tired. So I try to like to take a lot of rest in between and just mentally zone out a little bit as well. Yeah, I just, I find it kind of not mesmerizing, but like astounding. That's the word yeah. like that you can be in the middle of like a lead out train or whatever, like 5k to go and have the lung capacity and the mental capacity to shout at people to know what you need to have that clarity mm. and kind of the energy i guess in a way to like because if i'm near the front at 5k to go like a somewhat weird's gone on um but b like i'm blowing hard that there's no way i've got the the energy to shout at someone yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah that's yeah that's amazing to be honest um and yeah i guess um the next bit i wanted to chat to you about was like you mentioned i think on an instagram post that you had a, a real affinity to uk racing yeah. um and certainly because you're at the, the lincoln gp which i remember i actually watched um is a great race um, very cool. fifth? yeah i got fifth yeah <laughs> i was quite um, surprised about that <laughs> yeah yeah I, I don't know i feel like yeah it's a it's a good placing um mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to know. Like, yeah, it feels about right actually. Yeah, if you're not yeah. sure, yeah, I think that I was I was quite happy with it. Like to be fair, because mm. I, I heard a lot about it and I've seen it on on the streams and I watched the nationals in what was it two two thousand twenty one, probably yeah. when Pfeiffer won it, um, because my teammates were doing it and I was watching the whole race trying to like read their tactics and basically coaching from the side, um, calling BS and stuff, but. Um, once you like really get to do it yourself you like going up michael gate and you're like oh wow <laughs> this is actually really steep <laughs> which yeah, after like... one lap i was like oh i don't know how we're doing the finish here <laughs> yeah well that's the wild thing like i d i don't know if you can have tactics on that race because it's just <laughs> you know smash seven bells out of each other and whoever's still able to ride a bike at the end basically it's probably going to win you know? yeah no i think i think it's very possible to have a lot of good tactics up there and i think um kate did that perfectly as well with with how life was wrote it um but to be fair i was in kate's wheel when she went with one lap to go and i just i followed up until the cobbles and i was like i'm not going to sustain this for a minute so <laughs> I knew if I would do that, then I would have blown everything. I would not have been able to follow her. And if I looked back on Strav on the timings, I was like, yeah, no, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, so that was a smart choice not to go with her. But um, like, if I could have done that, I would have done that. But <laughs> I didn't have yeah. that in the legs. Um, but yeah, you can always like on the left, there was a lot of attacking going on. And to be honest, I think some teams could have probably got a better placing with some better tactics. But yeah, I think that's also something to learn. Yeah, definitely. It was, yeah, it, it looked like a brutal race. Um, I had to, like, I was looking after my two daughters that day. Um, yeah. Like, well, uh, their mum was at work, so um, it was a daddy-daughter day. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember pushing the buggy up Michael Gate, and I was like, oh, I might as well go on the road because the peloton's gone past. They're not going to be background for what twenty minutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like however long a lap is, <laughs> and the paths have got loads of people on the side. Yeah. So I'm just going to be annoying them. I might as well stick it up the middle, and that was hard work. Yeah, like, it's very working. hard. Yeah. 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 I was like, how do people ride up that? Because it... and they are not, they're not like clinkers. They are no proper jagged. They're proper cobbles. Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. I think it was quite funny to be honest because like I. I have one kick and the rest of it is just one speed. So, but if I ride up a climb like that, I know like, okay, I, I'm doing this for a minute. So I'm riding what I can ride for a minute. And then I start the climb normally like top five position and all these girls pass me really fast. And I'm like, oh, where's everyone go? Like, where's everyone going? What are they doing? 
<laughs> especially the first time I was like, well, I'm going to get dropped. Like, this is crazy. But then halfway up the climb before the corner, they all start slowing down. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm still doing the same what I was doing from the bottom. And I catch up with them and I hook on to the end of the group and that's fine. So I was like, oh, well, if they're doing this every lap and it got slower and slower every lap because, well, people run out of gas. So mm. for me, I was just doing the same thing over and over again because I knew like, well, if I go up that hard from the beginning, I'm not going to have anything left in the end. So I think that's also a little bit of experience, but because I was in a peloton that maybe wouldn't do that normally in a race, I was like, whoa, okay. But in a UCI, big UCI race, you're going to see that in the beginning of the race, you're going to see more like temporized riding on those climbs as well, because everyone's very aware of what they've got and what they can still have in the end. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And all of it, well, I know that like there was a couple of juniors racing up and that obviously changes the dynamics yeah. and, and just UK racing in general. It's, I, I, well, I can't speak to the women's racing because, you know, I've not done any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I did three, three and four cat races. So like proper, like entry level basically. Yeah. But it was always go as fast as you can from the gun and then see, see yeah, how far you can go, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, it strikes me that even the elite races are raced a little like that, where yeah. it's just smash each other to bits and then, you know, <laughs> the, the, the best will rise to the top. And yeah. that's, I guess you saw that on the, the climbing where they just go. Oh, let's just sprint up the first two. Let's just go meters. full out, especially the last time. I, I think I was passed by about ten girls, and then I passed passed all, almost all of them again um, before the <laughs> yeah. end of the climb because they went so hard and then bullarded halfway down. So, yeah, it's um, it's a tricky one. Yeah, but obviously, um, speaking of UK racing and the fact that Hess is now a UK team, they have been invited to um racing the women's tour of britain um is that a race that you're going to be attending yourself yes i will um, be awesome and what are your expectations going in what are the objectives like where are you at basically well um it is going to be quite hilly and i've i've ridden in wales before um it was not a very fun experience as i remember it for me personally because <laughs> it's it's very hilly um but yeah, I'm basically there to support my GC riders uh, throughout the week. Uh, so positioning, uh, helping out. That will probably be one of my first races where I actually am supporting the team instead of mm. trying to get the results. But maybe on stage three, um, it looks like a good opportunity for a sprint. Um, so yeah, probably we'll, we'll get an opportunity there to go for results. Um, so I think it would be a good combination between uh, a little bit of everything. But I'm actually really looking forward to racing there I'm, I'm gonna see a lot of my like um my boyfriend's family is coming out like there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that i know in the uk as well um just a lot of friends so that'll be really fun oh awesome and then i guess like thinking further ahead like what are your what are your goals for for the rest of the year Mm, it's it's a bit difficult because my main goal is to win a race like that's the main goal I set for myself this year I want to really win like a UCI race um last win was was two years ago I think um and I really believe that with the right setup and the right the right type of race I can do that uh I've been feeling really well and actually and reports last Sunday, I was feeling incredibly good and, and sadly had a lot of punctures and yeah, problems in the end. So got bunked out of the uh, first group, but yeah, that happens. And, and basically that win is the main goal. If I get a podium, that's great, but I'm really focused on, on the big result there. And yeah, that's what the team wants as well. So that's uh, the, the main objective. Wow. I mean, yeah, it'd be lovely to see it. You know, you never know. Dutch Championships, perhaps. Um, <laughs> if I win that one, that's basically World Championships. So that will be. Oh uh, well, yeah, it's... that would be the biggest win of my career for sure if that happens. Yeah, I, I'm gonna hazard a guess because I don't actually know off the top of my head. Is it going up the Vanberg by any chance? No. Um, it, it it was a big chance, but no, it's going up um, in Arnhem on the Postbank, which is basically oh. the last stage of CMAC Tour last year. 
Um, so it's a lot of uh, okay. little, little hills. So they found hills, but it's a lot less steep and there's a lot less climbing than last year because last year was in Limburg. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it suits me a bit better. Oh, bro. Um, the only thing that's left for me to say is like, how can people keep up with you on like social media? Just see, see what you're up to uh, and just follow your career, I guess, in some ways. Uh, well, you can follow me on my Instagram on Marjolein van Geloof, which is maybe hard for some people to spell, but um, for sure it will be somewhere written down. Um, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, and on the Hess uh, Instagram as well. We do a lot of uh, fun socials and TikToks and, and whatever. Um, I'm, I'm one of the older riders on the team, which is very funny uh, and and good to see as well with the young kids doing all their vlogs and, and, and TikToks and dances and everything and I'm well I'm, I'm enjoying it I think it's, it's quite fun um but yeah that's the main main way to follow me on Instagram basically and you have no idea how much that hurt when you said that you're old <laughs> the team, because I just looked it up like uh, I've got your profile up on like first cycling so I know yeah. it, like I could easily find how old you are yeah and I am four years older than you. I know, I know. So and in cycling, I am I am one of the older ones, and I'm one of the. They started calling me their mum, and I told them that they're not allowed to do that. So, oh, uh, no. <laughs> I'm not that old yet. <sighs> but yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's 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 the rules of cycling. If you're over twenty over twenty three, you're not you're not young anymore. So, yeah, the older you get, the the harder it gets. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm getting to the age where I could enter veteran racing um, yeah. soon, which is just like no, or masters New or age however category. you want to term it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like it. Um, or like, I think last year in the tour, I looked up like the date of birth of everyone who finished, mm -hmm. and it was like most of them weren't even in the same millennium as no, me. No, no. I'm like, yeah, no. That's... Yeah, a lot of my teammates that... are born after 2004, 2005. So I'm like, yeah, that is, um, that's a big difference. I remember that very well. <laughs> yeah, just, just you with a Zimmer frame in the court. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much um, for the chat. I yeah, thank you so you much for well. having me. Um, yeah. No, and yeah, we'll have to chat again soon. For sure. Thanks.